Um, maybe firstly, we need to note that education is not displayed through paper, but it's displayed through behavior. For us to see that you're educated, you need to act like someone who's educated. It is not enough for you to come and present a piece of paper to us and say you're educated while your behavior says something else. Um, Galatians 4 verse 16, have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth. Let us pray. Our dear and kind Heavenly Father, thank you for granting us this opportunity to meet in your house of worship and praise your name. Please engineer everything in such a way that all glory and honor will come to your name. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Galatians 1 verse 10, I do not seek the approval of men but of God. For if it were my will to please men, then I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. By these words I greet you all this morning. Amen. Amen. I have heard that Adventists don't only believe in the second coming, they also believe in a second greeting. So we are going to try a second greeting. And, and let me warn you, I'm going to greet you in Jesus' name. So before you say amen, think about the Jesus you are saying amen to. And hopefully that, okay, this time, this time, let's try it a bit different. Don't say amen until the preaching man says amen. We are together, ne? I greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, he who is not confined by the spectrum of time, for before the beginning was, he already was. He who is not confined by the universe, but he holds the whole universe in his hand. He is not subject to existence, for he exists from eternity all the way through eternity. He does not need life, for he himself is the life giver. Some of you might know him as Yahweh, and some of you might know him as Elohim. To some of you, he is Jehovah Jireh, the provider. To some of you, he is Jehovah Rapha, the healer. It is in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. This is the very same Jesus who opened the eyes of the blind. This is the very same Jesus who made the lame walk. This is the very same Jesus who resurrected the dead. This is the very same Jesus who can make you pass at school. This is the very same Jesus who can give you a job. This is the very same Jesus who can fix your marriage. This is the very same Jesus who can turn your situation upside down. And it is in the name of this Jesus that I greet you all this morning. Amen. So we do believe in the second greeting. <laughs> Our scripture reading, as we read earlier, comes from the book of Daniel. The chapter is 3. The verse is 16 all the way through to 18. I read in your hearing, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. May the good Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. You will forgive me, I run out of... Yes, let me drink first. I will need to drink water here and there. Um, the time is 11.40. Just like Adventist tradition, we'll try by all means that by 12 o'clock, at the very least, the sermon ends. But the aim is that by 12 o'clock, we'll be filing out. So if we are not filing out by 12 o'clock and I'm already sitting down, please invite me next time. I'm not the one who made you late. It's everyone else. Okay. Thank you. I was so happy when I saw um, West Rand students. I, I was at West Rand two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. And so when I saw them today, they were so excited. They're like, Sir, it's you. It's you. Please go and make some jokes. We love your jokes. Unfortunately, last time I was there, I was an MC. I wasn't preaching. So I'm like, Guys, sorry. Today I won't ma be making jokes. I'll be preaching. They said, We don't want a boring sermon. We've been coming to El Dorado Park for so long. We haven't slept. Please. Don't be the first to make us sleep. So I will try and shout so that they don't fall asleep because I didn't prepare any jokes. Today we are serious. Amen. Yes, that was a joke. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so today is Education Day. Thank you so much for, for, for the invitation. Um, maybe firstly, we need to note that education 
is not displayed through paper, but it's displayed through behavior. For us to see that you're educated, you need to act like someone who's educated. It is not enough for you to come and present a piece of paper to us and say you're educated while your behavior says something else. You know why we have a problem with pastors today in the Adventist church? We've got pastors who are causing havoc because they've got a paper that said, I studied theology, but things that they are doing were taught in Pathfinder classes not to do. It is important to note before we even start the sermon that education is seen in behavior and not in paper. It is not enough for you to go three years through the master guide class and then present to us a certificate that says, I went, I went through the master guide course and yet your actions say you need to go back to baptismal class. Education is seen through behavior and not through paper. And this is something we need also to teach our children. It is not enough for them to come uh, back with their reports from West Rand Primary School with high marks and yet their behavior says otherwise. The reason why we take our children to Adventist schools is because we want them to grow like Adventists grow. It is not enough for them to come back home with distinctions and yet their behavior says otherwise. Education is seen in behavior and not on paper. So then, for us to appreciate the text that we just read, we have to look at the background of the boys who now stand in question in front of the king. It's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But if you go back to chapter 1, there is a scene right there. The king of Israel is Jehoiakim. Hey, yeah, I think that's the name. If I pronounced it wrong, you'll forgive me. We'd also like to acknowledge everyone who's watching online. We, we, we hope you are blessed. We are right there with you. Be it you're watching today or any other day, please feel blessed. Yes, I welcomed you. I didn't welcome them. So I was now welcoming them. Back to the sermon. So in chapter 1, we've got King Nebuchadnezzar who goes and, inv uh, and invades the nation of Israel. The king of Israel of that time is given to the king of Nebuchadnezzar by God. Sorry, to the king of Babylon, which is Nebuchadnezzar by God. Nebuchadnezzar conquers Israel not because Nebuchadnezzar is strong. Nebuchadnezzar conquers Israel because God gives over Israel to Nebuchadnezzar. Someone is missing it. You see the problem with the children of Israel? They thought they were the thing. Because now they were the children of God, they thought they were invincible. But I want to present to you a God today who gives and takes privileges as he wants. Just because you're an elder this year, doesn't mean El Dorado Park will run on you. When God decides that he wants to remove you from that position, the same way he put you up there, he will remove you and will put someone else who will do a better job than you. Some of us, we are CEOs at our workplaces and we treat our subordinates as if they are not human beings. Let me tell you something. The very same God who made you a supervisor can demote you and then put someone else who will be able to treat their subordinates better than you do. Therefore, it is important to note that in whatever position we hold in life, it's not because we deserve to be there, but it's because we serve a God who gives and he takes as he pleases. And mind you, after he has blessed you, and you don't use those blessings faithfully for the glorification of his name, he will simply withdraw them and give them to someone else who will be faithful with those blessings. So therefore, be careful in the positions that you hold. Be careful how you treat those who are your subordinates. Be careful how you treat those around you because you've got something that they don't have. Because he is a God who gives and takes as he pleases. Now the problem with Nebuchadnezzar, he thought he conquered Israel because he was strong enough. That's why he was able to say to his subordinates, Go into the temple of Israel. Take the vessels of Israel that belong to their God and come and put them in our temple because our God stands supreme over the God of Israel. That's the first mistake that he did. He thought he conquered Israel because he was strong enough. Hey, 
we conquer through the journey of life, not because we are capable of doing so. We do so because the one we believe in is capable of doing so. We go through life and we conquer and we become successful, not because there's anything special about us, but because there is a God in heaven. So therefore, it is important to note in whatever accomplishment you have in life, that you are not there because you deserve to be there. You are there because there is a God in heaven. That's the topic of the day. There is a God in heaven. So when King Nebuchadnezzar takes over the nation of Israel, he says to his servant, go into Israel and go into the royal house and find everyone who has the ability to be someone special in the future. Go and look for every educated child in the camp of Israel that is royalty and bring them to me so that I can train them in the ways of Babylon. Which was the very first mistake that King Nebuchadnezzar did. You see, let's start here. It's education day. These boys that he sent his servants to go and capture were educated by their parents on how to live a life of an Israelite. So then now, he says, go and take all those who are educated. By doing so, he is saying to his servants, go and take the God of Israel from the camp of Israel and bring him to Babylon. His plan was to change the God of Israel into worshipping the God of Babylon. But what he did not know is that by bringing these educated boys into the camp of Babylon, he was turning the whole Babylon into worshipping the God of Israel. The importance of educating your children. Point number one, the first education system your children will ever go through is home education. Before you take them to West Rand Primary School, you first teach them at home how an Israelite is supposed to behave themselves. The reason why some of us, our children, grew up and they didn't behave anything that is Christian-like, it's because at home we didn't train them up to be Christians. So when they went to Babylon, instead of turning Babylon into Israel, Babylon turned them into Babylonians. The importance of training your child while he's still at home. The first that I have never seen an Africans speaking child in a Zulu home. Never. Why so? Because they adopt what the parents teach them. So therefore, you cannot find a Christian in a Babylon-like home. Never. Why? Because our children take after what we teach them. So he goes and he takes all these educated boys. Among them is the four special ones we know from the book of Daniel. It's Daniel, it's Meshach, it's Abednego, and it's Shadrach. And after they take them, firstly, one of the first things that the servant does, he gives them new names. By doing so, hey, mind you, the, the, the Hebrew parents gave their children names according to the character traits they wanted to see in their children. So if they wanted to see a blessing come out of the young one, then they would name that specific child blessing. We should be careful of the names we give our children because some of our children will take after those names. I've got one big problem with one of the names that is in my language. There are people in my language called Senzen. Translated to English is what did we do? It sounds like a joke because... Uh, you are not Zulu, but those of you who are Zulu in the congregation know exactly what I'm talking about. How can you give birth to a child and then you, you name them, what did we do? And then you wonder later when they grow up, wherever they go, everyone regrets having them around. It's because they took after their name. I'm one person who struggled to find the meaning of my name. Right in, I went to the dictionary, I went to the internet. All I could find was it's a city in England. I, I struggle to find the meaning of my name. I mean, I want to take after my name. What does my name mean? Until someone said to me, have you noticed that everywhere you go, you brighten up the mood? Those of you who know me will know that I'm here today because I brightened up the mood somewhere else. And so they asked me to come and brighten it up at El Alto. 
National Park. It is important to give your children names that you want them to grow up to be. So the Hebrew, the, the Hebrew parents used to give their children names according to character traits that they wanted to see from their children. So now the first thing that the servants of Babylon do when they capture the, the Hebrew children is they change their names. Teach your children their identity. We've got a problem of confused children out there because they were not educated enough in their identity. They don't know who they are. Teach your children that they are Adventists. Teach them how Adventists behave. It is not enough for your child to grow up in an Adventist setup and not be taught the ways of Adventism. We've got a, a problem of children who are confused right now, not because they didn't grow up in Christian homes, but because they were not taught Christian ways. It is not enough for your children to grow up in an Adventist environment, but not be educated in Adventist ways. You know why we've got uh, youth who get kicked out of camps because of misbehaving? It's not that they didn't grow up in Adventist environments. They did. But no one bothered those children Adventist ways. But with the four Hebrew boys, including Daniel, it was different. The aim of the servant who gave them new names was not necessary. Mind you, the new names he gave them were pledging allegiance to the gods of Babylon. Let me tell you something. When your children leave your home, they will find Babylonians out there who will give them names that will, that will give allegiance to the gods of Babylon. If you think I'm lying, go and ask around what's the name, what, 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 na or what name they, they, they have given your, your kid in the streets. And then you will realize that all these names are pledging allegiance to the gods of Babylon. So the Hebrew boys were given names that would pledge allegiance to the gods of Babylon. And this was the tactic that the servant was using. He wanted to turn these boys slowly but surely into believing into the gods of Babylon. He didn't just overflood them with everything. So he said, I will start by giving them names that pledge allegiance to the gods of Babylon. No one will take your child from your home and will flip them like that. But slowly but surely, the devil has cunning ways, has cunning devices to turn your children from being an Adventist into what he wants them to be. And the only way they can survive in Babylon is if you give them the education they need to survive in Babylon. Let me tell you something. Your children will be educated out there. If you fail, ha, it's six minutes to twelve. You, okay, let's wrap it up. If you fail to teach your children at home, someone else will teach them out there. If you fail to teach your children, TikTok will do the teaching for you. If you fail to teach your children, Facebook will teach them for you. Peer pressure will teach them for you. If you fail to teach your children the ways of Israel, someone out there in Babylon will teach your children for you. The question is, are you happy with your child taking after the teachings of Babylon? Are you happy with your child being educated by those who grew up in Babylon? And if you are not, maybe it's high time you started doing something about the education of your children. So they take these boys, long story short, we are running out of time, and, and, and they give them new names. They are trying to marinate them into becoming Babylonians so that slowly by surely they can pledge allegiance to the gods of Babylon. And at some point the king says, hey, these are very special boys. Don't just give them anything to eat. They need to eat what I eat. Okay? They need to eat what I eat. Meat, wine, hey, all the good stuff. But here is the thing. The meat that was provided to Daniel and his friends, was first sacrificed to the gods of Babylon. But now because Daniel and his friends were educated by their parents while they were still in Israel, then they were able to say to the servant of the king, please just give us vegetables and water. We will not eat what the Babylonians eat. There is a problem if your children, when they are introduced to the customs of Babylon, they see nothing strange about them. The reason why 
Daniel and his friends were able to identify that the diet is strange. It's because they were educated at home that we don't eat such as Israelites. Therefore, if your children are out there in the world and they give them certain beverages and they don't see anything strange about these beverages, but they consume these beverages, then the problem is at home, not with the children. How many a times have we attacked our children? You guys are drunkards. You guys smoke. Blah, 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 blah. It was your duty as the parent to make sure that when they go into Babylon, they find the customs of Babylon strange. The reason why they don't find these customs strange, it's because you did not educate them enough to go and survive in Babylon. So because the four Hebrew boys were educated by their parents, they were able to say to the king, we will not partake of this diet, for we have a custom in Israel. This is what they taught us to consume, not this. Therefore, we will not consume this. Mind you, Daniel had all the rights to eat. He had every reason to partake of that diet. Number one, it was delicious. Let's start right there. Let's start right there. Meat is delicious. I know we've got a controversy about whether meat is right or wrong, but bottom line is meat is delicious. So number one, the food that was presented to them was appealing to them. Number two, had they consumed of, 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 of the diet that was given to them, they were going to be right with the king. Mind you, Babylon was the biggest empire in the world at that time. So if they, if, if they ate what the king gave them, they were running a risk of being in good books with the most powerful men in the world. They had every reason to partake of that diet. But they said to themselves, because there is a God in heaven, we were taught that such things we do not do. Therefore, we will not do them, even if it means we'll be disadvantaged at some points in life. Your child needs to be educated on how sacred and holy the Sabbath is. Even when they are at their lowest and someone offers them a job and says we'll have to work on a Sabbath, even if they have every reason to take that job, they should be able to stand and say, there is a God in heaven. We did not do this in our home. I will not start doing it now. Educate your children in Israelite customs up to a point whereby they will be able to go and survive in Babylon. Because if you fail to do so, the God of Babylon will take over your children. We're running out of time. Let's conclude this. Let's conclude this. So they say, and they challenge, they challenge the servant of the king. Give us fruit, give us vegetables, give us 10 days. And after 10 days, examine us and examine those who eat the food of the king. And you be the judge yourself on whether this diet is good or is not good for us. Long story short, they spent 10 days eating fruits and vegetables. After 10 days, when they were examined, they were by, by far much more handsome than those who ate the diet of the king. They were by far much more smart than those who ate the diet of the king. They were by far much more superior than those who ate the diet of the king. Our children need to be taught that when you stand with God, God will not forsake you. For there is a God in heaven who will come to your aid after everyone else forsakes you. They were able to stand for God. Therefore God said, I will not let my children stand for me and dishonor them. Therefore God blessed them because they were able to stand for God. Educate your children that there is a God in heaven who rewards faithfulness to his law. Some of you, the reason why your children take a uh, light to the law of God, it's because you didn't teach them of a God who rewards for being faithful to his law. Let me tell you today, God rewards those who are faithful to his law. So when the boys stood with God, God stood with the boys, and therefore the boys were successful in their course. Long story short, they were to be trained for three years in the language of the Babylonians, in the customs of the Babylonians, in the ways of the Babylonians, and three years later passed, and the king came, came to examine everyone who had been put under special care, and when he got to Daniel, to Shadrach, to Meshach, and to Abednego, the king was very pleased. He said, I will put these four boys in the highest rank in Babylon. Babylon was the most powerful state of that time. The king says, I will take these boys 
and I will make them one of the most powerful people in the world. But now the problem comes when you come to Daniel chapter 3. Because now we've got these boys who stand in a high position in Babylon. And if you read in Daniel chapter 2, there is a whole controversy and there is a story which is a sermon for another day about a statue. But for today's sermon, we'll skip Daniel chapter 2 and we'll go to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3, the king commands his servants, make for me a golden image all the way from the head to the toe. And then he passes a decree that once you hear music, everyone in Babylon needs to bow down to this idol. But then now there is a problem because we've got three Hebrew boys who are high ranking in the land of Babylon. And now the king of Babylon says to, says to everyone, you are all going to worship the statue that I'm making for you. But then the problem comes when the music sounds and everyone bows except the three Hebrew boys. When the three Hebrew boys don't bow, those who are jealous of the boys run to the king and they say to the king, you have placed three Hebrew boys high rank in your country, but they are refusing to follow your commandments. The king is frustrated. The king is angry. He calls the boys. He says to the boys, you did not bow, but I'll give you a second chance. When you hear the music, I need you to bow. Otherwise, I'm casting you into the burning furnace. He does the whole thing again. There is music. Everyone bows. The boys don't bow. The king is angry. He calls very strong men from his army. He commands that the fire be, be rekindled seven times. And it... Oh. Okay, okay. He commands that the fire be rekindled seven times up to the hottest possible flame we have ever heard of. And he says to three strong men, take these boys and cast them into the fire. Before he casts them into the fire, the boys say to him, listen now, O king, we will not bow down to your statue because we know that our God is able to save us. Because we know that there is a God in heaven. We will neither worship you nor your statue. And, and then they say, here is the interesting part, even if he does not, let it be known that we will not worship Teach your children that sometimes God will not, not because he is not able to, but because he chooses not to. And when God chooses not to, our faithfulness to God needs to remain. We've got a problem of children who are faithful to God based on what God gives them. When they feel like God is not giving them what they want, they start going outside to search for what they want. But the boys say to the king, even if you throw us to the fire and we die in the fire, mind you, we know that our God can save us. But if he chooses not to save us, still we will worship that God. Long story short, they bind the boys. They throw them into the fire. After they throw them into the fire, the fire was so hot, those who threw the boys in the fire, they died because of the flame of the fire. But as the king looked into the fire, then he realized there is a fourth man in the furnace. Listen, man, when they throw you in the furnaces of life, there is a fourth man waiting for you in the furnace. The Bible says three were thrown in, four were seen in. They were walking around the fire. The king comes closer and he says, Hey, Daniel, Meshach, and Abednego, who is the fourth man in there? Come out here and tell me about him. And the boys step out of fire. The Bible says not even a hair on their head caught fire. Their clothes didn't even smell like smoke. And as they came out, then the king says, everyone in my, in my city, everyone in my country, everyone in my kingdom will worship the God that these boys worship because clearly he is faithful to keep those he loves. Let's conclude this right there. There is a God in heaven who is able to deliver you from whatever fairness you are facing in life. And you need to teach your children that there is a God in heaven. Even if it means they give up their lives for this God, let it be because he is faithful enough to carry us through the fairnesses of life. But the four Hebrew boys are not the only people who are educated about this God. Talk about David. David arrives at battleground. There is a huge man, a Philistine, a giant, tormenting the children of Israel for 40 days and 40 nights. And as David arrives, he is carrying a sling and he is carrying a staff. The giant feels insulted. He says to David, I will surely kill you and I will feed your meat to the dogs. Then David says, you come at me with sword, you come at me with spear. Now let me educate you. I come to you with the God from heaven. Long story short, the giant was slain. A whole, a whole giant was killed by a stone. Little is much when God is in it. 
if you think that's enough, there is Esther in the kingdom. Her people are bound to die. Then she says to her people, fast for three days and for three nights because I know that there is a God in heaven who will be able to deliver us from this decree. Long story short, Esther's people were saved. Do you think that's enough? There is a girl captured in the house of Naaman. Naaman is dying from leprosy. The girl says to the mistress, does not, your, does not my master know that there is a God in heaven who can heal leprosy? you think that's enough? Daniel is threatened to be thrown into the lion's den. But he believes, although he's thrown into the lion's den, that there is a God in heaven who is able to shut the mouth of the lions. Let me talk to someone today. You are facing unemployment problems. Let me educate you. There is a God in heaven who can bless you with a job. You are failing in school. Let me educate you. There is a God in heaven who can make you pass in school. You are facing marriage problems. Let me educate you. There is a God in heaven. Who can fix your marriage? Nothing is too impossible for that God. Here we are today. The sermon is simple. There is a God in heaven. Learn to be educated in that fact. And then you will be able to conquer through the battles of life. Revelation 22 verse 21. May the grace of the Lord be with you all saints. Amen. <laughs>